it. You know, and uh, you know, NumPy comes with a, a function that does that, that calculates the mean or the median. Um, do you trust it? <laughs> Why? Maybe, maybe not. How do you know? You don't know, right? It's just a software package. You, unless you go dig through the history, you don't know how well it was reviewed. You don't know whether the person who reviewed it knew anything about SKU or, or the median, you know? Um, how about your own code? Do you trust your own code? <laughs> right? And uh, I don't either, you know? I, I know how good my code is. Um, and so if I, if I just handed you a SKU routine, I would tell you not to trust it because I know how I write code. Um, and, and, and because I know I'm fallible and because, it, you know, and, and I'm almost as good a software developer as anybody, uh, and I know how many mistakes I make, I know I can't just trust people to make mistake-free perfect code. And so I want to see tests. And in fact, things like NumPy and SciPy and scikit-learn all come with tests. You can open up a Python prompt, import NumPy, and type np.test. And it will run the whole NumPy test suite and tell you, uh, you know, and you'll see passes or failures. And that's something you can do to kind of see whether it's uh, integrated correctly with your system. Sometimes um, SciPy especially will have a little difficulty accessing libraries or something, um, and you'll find errors in, in obscure corners of SciPy. That happens quite frequently on Macs. Um, but you still, there's kind of another level there whether you want to know whether the function you're actually using was included in all of those tests, but at least there were tests there. At least they took that seriously. But then it's open source, so you can go to the source code and actually find out whether there was a test for your particular function. And then probably you can trust it. Right, you found out that there were actually tests for that function that you're using. You actually ran those tests and they passed and you're okay, you're good to go. And uh, so that's like trusting library code, but, but as you're working and making your own code, it's still nice to know whether you've done it correctly. Um, and kind of the traditional way of doing that is either sort of like a guess and check thing, right? Where you write it and you run it and you're like, yeah, that looks about right. Um, or, uh, or you read the code really carefully, character by character, and you're like, yeah, I'll buy that. <laughs> right? and, then, and then you go on with your life. And then, and then in a couple of months, you're like, why is, this, why is this not working? And you go back and you find out you had, a, you had a, an off by one error in there. And uh, you, you know, those are just the kinds of things you don't find by reading code. Reading code is a horrible way especially your own code. Reading other people's code is actually fairly effective. Um, but it's sort of like when you, when you write an essay or something, you will have horrible typos in there and completely missing words. But because you wrote it, your, your brain will just fill all of that in and fix it. But when somebody else reads it, it, it they'll find all of that because they're, it's new to them. The same thing is true for code. Code you write, you will have a really hard time finding difficulty. And other people will find it easier, which is why code review is a thing. Um, we didn't really talk about this with everybody on, on the Git segment, but on, when you're contributing on GitHub, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll make changes, commit them to a branch, and then make a pull request where you'll, you'll notify the admins on a project and say, hey, I've made a bunch of changes and I would like them integrated into the main project. And they'll get a chance to look over your code and uh, uh, actually critique it, sort of edit it, if you will, um, and they'll make comments and say, hey, this doesn't look quite right, and you'll be like, oh yeah, what was I thinking, and you know, and kind of have this dialogue, and so that actually works quite well for finding obvious sort of things, typos and stuff, because people just sort of, you know, it's like having an editor for your essay. Um, but when it comes down to it, tests are, are really kind of the best way, and the nice thing about it, right, going back to that guess and check thing where you like run it and just kind of eyeball it, you can automate all of that so that every time you make a change, you run the same set of tests and the computer says, hey, everything looks pretty good, or oops, this one didn't work, um, instead of having to eyeball everything. And as you write more and more code on larger and larger projects, 
that becomes more and more of a time saver because you're, you know, at, at some point that doesn't scale, right? Like NumPy probably comes, NumPy comes with thousands and thousands of tests, right? There's no, there's no eyeballing all of that. It, it's just writing tests is the great way, it, it is kind of how you automate that checking so that every time people make changes, you know whether they've broken something or not. All right, so let's go on to, to what we're actually going to do today so we get some practice here. We have, uh, well, let's uh, go back to the shell. So everybody should have, right, you've been working in, in some kind of shell, and you've cloned um, your fork, right? And uh, let's see. So I'm in this, you know, I'm I'm in the root directory of this repository here, um, and uh, you'll need to remember the bit about remotes in a little bit, um, so that you can add your whichever group member your this thing you're working on. You're going to need to add them as a remote in a little bit, so remember that. But we won't do that right now. Um, but make sure you're here, and then uh, we'll go into the software engineering directory. And let me blow this up and make this a little more convenient. Not that. OK. Um, oops. CD. And then we. Then we look at this. So we've got a bunch of these animals.txt files. And they look like this. They've got four columns. There's a date, a time, an animal type, and then a number of that animal scene. And you got to watch out for these grizzlies. They're coming in herds now. Um, but it's kind of a, a, field, a field observation sort of data that you might get. Um, and our. Our goal today is to write a command line script that um, where we, we give it a file name and an animal name, and it prints the mean number of that animal scene per sighting in that file. And I've already written the script part of this. Um, it looks like this. So we've got the script part of this. I can actually I could go run this from the command line. Uh, let's see. I don't know if the mode is right. Oh, no, I don't. Do it this way. So if I do Python and then the name of that file, Python will run it. Um, and I didn't, I didn't call it correctly, so I printed out a little help message. But if I if I give it a a, a file name. And then uh, an animal name. We get an error because there's some code missing from the library that this script calls. So this this script imports something called animals. So let's take a look at that. And what that actually means is the animals.py file in this same directory. So let's look at that. So this is, this is kind of our library of code that we've, we're building for working on this. And our, our job today is to, is to write a, this command line script um, that calculates the mean number of animals seen per sighting for a particular animal in a particular file. But that's just one very specific analysis of, of many, many, many analyses we could do with this data. Right there, you might do stuff with the times and the dates and different groupings of the animals and stuff. There's all kinds of analyses you can do with these files. So when we write this code to work with it, if we're smart, we'll really keep that code pretty general. We won't make a lot of assumptions about how the, the we're going to write a lot of individual functions that do little specific things. And we won't make a lot of assumptions about how those are used to kind of maximize the reusability of this in the future. One good example of that, right, is to these these animals.txt files have 
a very predictable uh, uh, file format. So a smart thing to do would be to write a reader function that we can use over and over and over again to read these files uh, for all of the different analyses we're going to do. The one we're going to do today, but every one we're going to do in the future. We don't need to write this function twice. They're all going to be the same. So let's take a look at that. It's already here in the animals.py file. It's called readanimals. Um, it's got a doc string that explains what it does, how to call it, and what it returns. It's a useful thing to have. And I've already written the code here for it. Okay. So where, where do the tests live? The tests live in another file here called testanimals.py. Testanimals.py. And you can see up at here at the top, I've got import animals. So this is, how I, this is how my tests get a hold of the code in the other file. I say import animals, and that means get the code from animals.py. And uh, now I, sh I ought to write a test here. All right, so uh, I'm going to kind of go through writing this test, and then we'll set you guys loose on writing some more code and tests. So the, the kind of, um, we're working today on unit tests, and there are many kinds of different testing. There's regression testing and integration testing. And um, in unit tests, you kind of, you, you test a unit of your code, a unit of your project, and a lot, usually that's like a function, a class method. You're kind of testing very specific functionality. In, in something like a regression test, you will, you'll run a much broader, you'll run a whole pipeline and then compare the results to your, your yesterday's results to see whether you've, anything has changed accidentally. Um, but in, in all of those different kinds of testing, you are taking, you're running the code and taking what it gave you and comparing it to something else, usually some kind of right answer. And so that's what we're going to set up here. So if we look at the animals.txt file, it's this very small file. I also have this big animals file that's, you know, that's a hundred lines long, and um, for for our tests, working on this, which is a hundred lines, which is actually not a very large file in in the scheme of things, um, is kind of a headache, right? If if we want to test, uh, you know, if we want to list out all of the instances of Wolverine sightings in this file, it would take us a long time, and it would be a headache. So over in animals.txt, we've taken a very small subset of, of this data, and we're, we're, we're going to use this for testing because it's manageable, and we're just going to say, it worked on this uh, five-line file, so it really ought, it ought to work on a hundred-line file, probably. Um, so it makes testing a lot easier. So over here in testanimals.py, the first thing I'm going to do is, is actually execute my code under test and, and get its results so that I can compare it to um, the my oracle, my right answers. So let's do this first. Actually, oh, let's put it in here just uh, think first. So if I go back over here and I, I look at what this returns, um, it returns some lists, Python lists, the dates, times, species, and counts. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so that that uh, that ties into how how um, like sure like you know it, it's kind of a question you'll have to ask in your project is like how much work do I want to put in protecting against these weird conditions in the files and um, you know it, it's not just the, so y you only want to test for things that your that your your code does usually um, so if you're if you're not going to if you're not going to put in code in your reading function to handle weird case situations then don't test for them if you are going to put in code to test for weird case situations then go ahead and test for them yeah um, it just sort of depends on on what uh, um, 
what you're planning to handle and what you expect to have to handle, that they will do that. Yeah, so one, one thing that um, is uh, a very common practice in development is that any time you put in a bug fix, you write a test that, so you know some, some user will report like, hey, I tried this code and it crashed on this input. And you'll put in a fix for that, but you also put in a test that triggers that to make sure it doesn't reappear later. Um, so we're living in a very idealized world today where, where everything is perfect with your files. And I, I sort of actually kind of like a philosophy where I kind of strictly define the, the inputs my programs will expect. And if an error occurs, I, I try to give an, a helpful error to the user, but I tell them to fix it. You know, like if your input is broken, go fix your input um, is one philosophy. And, and, you know, so you can... Right, you know, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you definitely, it, but it, it, it depends, right? You're, just because you're testing certain things, your code also has to handle that, right? So you might, you might add case handling to your code, um, and you should definitely test that. You should test everything your code does. That, I mean, that's kind of the philosophy, right? If you're going to handle weird case issues in your input files, you should test that. If you're not, maybe you don't have to worry about testing it. I guess the, simp the simplest way to put it is test everything your code does. Yeah. All right, so let's actually call this, this function. Um, and we'll just do dates, times, species counts. And uh, we just pass in a file name. I'm going off of the doc string here. Um, OK, so good, good, good thing to have. Um, and then we need uh, the other half of this is we need the reference data, the, the right answer. And um, I've prepared. This isn't part of the repo, but I put this together for my benefit today. Um, is uh, is the right is kind of the the reference data here, um, so I don't have to type it out so laboriously. Well, I did, but I did it yesterday. Um, so kind of the ref dates equals this set of data, right? So this is basically just I've I've looked at. So we're using this animals.txt file as our input test data. And so I've just kind of manually put together the right answer from that, from that very, and this is why we would use a very small file for this particular test. So you can you can see a couple of, of things going on. One thing is that um, if we look at the doc string here, most of these are most of these are coming back as lists of strings. But the the function promises that the the counts will come back as integers. So this function must be doing some sort of conversion from the the strings that come out of the file to integers for the counts. So we'll we'll test that here. You know these are integers. Everything else is strings. Um, now for the actual tests. 
Um, so there are a couple of ways you can do tests, right? You could use an if statement, something like this. If dates does not equal ref dates, and then I don't know, print a warning or something. Um, but what we do in, in testing is we use a state, Python statement called assert. And let's see what that looks like. So we're gonna say assert that dates is, is equal to ref dates. And what this assert statement does is you give it a condition. And if that condition does not evaluate to true, Python will throw up an error. And this can come in handy um, if we go back to our, our file reading discussion, if you want your program to just stop execution when it encounters some kind of unexpected problem, this assert statement comes in really handy. So you can, um, in this reading file example, uh, you know, every, every column, this, this is, uh, this, our files are supposed to have four columns, date, time, species, and count. And so you could put an assert there that for every line, it should have four columns. If it doesn't have four columns, stop execution. You can say assert len line equals four. Um, and if that's ever not true, your code will just stop. And you can have it print out a useful warning, a, a useful error message saying like, oh, I encountered a, a non-standard line in this file. Here's the line number, for example. Um, so that's not even in a test. That's actually in your running code but it protects, you can use it to protect against unexpected conditions um, or error conditions um, right in your code. Uh, you can, what I generally don't actually use a cert in those situations, but I do put, I still put in tests, I use if. So I'll say if some condition is not true or is true, and then I'll use another thing called raise, and I'll raise a specific exception. Um, if you Google, Python exceptions, you can read a lot more about this, but it's possible to raise really specific errors with your custom error message so that users, it just, it's just providing more information to the users so that they can better debug and better understand what went wrong. But that's a nice thing to do when you're, when you're writing. So there's, there's testing on the end, so we're testing at the end here. It's also possible to do a little bit of uh, kind of um, guaranteeing of inputs or outputs in your actual code kind of as a, a user usability uh, enhancement. Anyway, so we're going to do this, just assert this, and we're gonna do this for all of these. Um, times. So I'm just, I'm setting up this, I'm saying, the thing I got out of my function should equal this thing that I verified is right by looking at the file that I passed into the function. Great. So how about actually running this test? Yeah, that would be a good idea. So if we go back to the shell here, um, we're going to use something called nose tests. There are, this is something that's not part of core Python, it's a, a Python add-on. Um, it comes with things like Anaconda and the nthought Python distribution. And it's, it's not the only one of its uh, uh, kind, it, it's a, a testing framework. There's another one called pi.test that I use a lot. Um, for your purposes, you'll find them pretty much almost the same. Um, and what this does is we, if you, especially if you have a lot of tests, these, fr these frameworks make it really nice to just run them all. Because what it will actually do is it will go through your project, uh, like your project directory tree, it'll find files that look like tests. That's why we named our test file test underscore something. Nose test will see that and be like, hey, this file probably contains tests. And look, at, it'll look in that file. If we look at our, so I named this function test underscore something. Again, nose test will see this function and say, hey, that looks like a test. I will run that. And it'll do that. So if I run nose tests, and I'm actually just going to pass in the name of the file, but even if I, well, let's see what happens if I don't. I just say nose tests with no arguments. 
So it um, it actually found this, and it's it's giving me this big long message because there was a failure. Something is incorrect when it's saying, but it's actually this test animals file, and here's the function that it ran, test read animals, and here's a message describing the error condition. Um, I could also do this by um, passing in this file. If, if you had a lot of test files and you only wanted to run one, one of them because it was a function you were working on that you were testing, you can pass in just one file and then it'll only run the test in that file. Same deal. Um, but so there's a problem. We've discovered a problem. It's not behaving as expected. So we can double check our, our test for one thing, but this all looks pretty good. Um, we're comparing dates to dates and times to times and stuff, so we haven't accidentally kind of mixed up one of our, our results and our expected results. So let's go look at the animals, uh, the actual function here. So I, I wrote my test based on the doc string here. And uh, doc strings are a good thing to write even before you started really working on your function um, because you you define the inputs and the outputs, which which is actually kind of a hard part of programming. A lot of times you'll be like, I need to do a thing. But if you break that down into kind of individual steps and what each of those individual steps needs and what it will return, it kind of makes organizing your code a little easier. And you can actually write your tests that way. You can write your tests before you write any code by defining what will that code need, like that function? What are the inputs to that function and the outputs? That is literally everything you need to know to write a test for something. And so when you write the test beforehand, you saw how easy it is to run these with nose tests. You can just like, it's one line, nose test, bam. And then it says like, hey, I ran it and everything worked or everything didn't work. And so as you're writing a function, being able to make a change, click to your, uh, your terminal, press up, return, run nose tests, and it tells you whether you're done or not is brilliant. Like, I love working this way where I write my tests before I even write my functions. And then as I work, I just go like, you know, I'll write some code and I'll be like, okay, I think that should do it. I think I'm done. And then I run my tests and my tests are like, ha, sucker, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, and, but it's like, I don't have to convince myself by reading my code that I'm done writing that function. My tests tell me. Um, and it, it just sort of takes like a mental load off. I, I find that really nice. Um, let's, so let's take a look here. So this is what my, my doc string, this is what my doc string says this function does. Um, and here we go. So we've got, so we open the file, we do all of this. Um, and, uh, okay, great. So let's, and, and here's where we return things, right? We return these four lists. And it's date times count species. But if I look up here at my doc string, this says date time species counts. So like I made this, I made this simple error. I listed these out in the wrong order down here at the bottom, right? So let's make this match my, make that match my, um, what my doc string actually said this function does. All right, so I made that little change. I press save, go back over here, press up, okay. So now I know I'm done with that function because my test tells me I'm done. Right. So it ran one test and it's okay. No, no, well, no. Like, this is the this is the current test. The in general, the less you see from these these reports, the better. They they're very succinct when everything is okay, and they're. More, much more verbose when, when there's a failure or an error because they, they give you a bunch of information pointing to where the error occurred and what was wrong. Um, it's also possible to, uh, to drop into debuggers when you do this. So if, I, if, if you have an error and with nose tests, if you, if you put this flag, PDB failures, um, it will actually drop you into the Python debugger when it encounters a fail, a failed, failing test, and you can do Python debugger stuff like print out variables and stuff. Or if you if you do just PDB, it'll drop you into the debugger when it encounters errors other than test failures, um, and which is very handy too, because you can you can actually be in the debugger, print out variables, and go up and down the stack and kind of see what's going on. Uh, so so testing is kind of a valuable debugging tool. 
also. So, questions about what we've done so far? Got the idea here. So, there's nothing too magical about this. We're, um, you know, we're making this file of tests with the little test functions, and uh, but fundamentally, all we're doing is saying, here's the right answer. I ran my code and got this answer. Are they the same? Tell me, computer, are they the same? Okay, so now it's going to be your turn. So we go back to uh, here. So if we look at if we look at the uh, the animals.py file, our library, there's this this mean function, right? So we're calculating the mean number of animals seen per sighting. We're going to need some way to calculate the mean. And uh, so you're going to write that. So you're going to break into two within your little group. You're going to you've you've made two subgroups. One subgroup is going to write the mean function in animals.py. The other group is going to write the test mean function in testanimals.py. And so one group here is going to write, try to write an unbreakable function. The other group is trying to be really malicious and break that function. And you're going to use GitHub and Git to put them together. So when either group has, um, when you're done with your test or you're done with your function, you know, do add, commit, and push it to um, whoever's repository you're working on. And uh, so there's going to be a little trick. Whoever goes first is going to be in good shape. Whoever goes second is going to have to pull those changes before they can push again to kind of integrate the two things, I think. Uh, um, so you're going to have a little bit of, of fun Git experience here too. And, and we'll all be available to, to get you through that when the time comes. Um, but whoever goes, whoever tries to push second is going to have to pull before they can push. So remember that. All right, you guys ready? So one of the groups writes the mean function, one of them writes the test mean function. And then we'll see how you guys square up against each other. 